We are in the Minor Prophets Bible Study, Part 2, and we have studied our way through Joel, Amos, and Obadiah, and we're now on Jonah and learning about this prophet of God and his experiences and learning from them about ourselves and about our God. And this is uh, a mural or a, uh, what do you call, mosaic, a mosaic of Jonah, as we see here. And there's this uh, creature down here in the bottom right corner that God prepared to swallow him up. And, uh, and uh, we're going to learn about that today as well. Okay, so last week we read the entire four chapters in context together, and we broke it down into a series of groups that we would then use to study the book. And if you have your handouts, you should have this with notes on it already, uh, we decided last week that the first section was verses 1 through 4, and based on what it says, who Jonah is, and what Jonah has done, we titled it, You Can Run, But You Cannot Hide From God. And so that's the first section that, uh, that we will deal with. Then the next section is verses 5 through 16, and this one talks about Jonah's experience on the ship, with the crew, and it's Jonah and the pagan sailors. It's really interesting to me that Jonah was called originally by God to go to a pagan people of Assyria in Nineveh and preach to them about their malignancy, about their terrible treatment of others, and about their sin. Jonah didn't want to do that, so he rebelled and ran. And where does God put him? In a ship of pagan sailors. So he didn't do as God had commanded him and witness to a group of pagan Assyrians, but he did find himself in the midst of a group of pagan sailors. And we're going to look at his interaction with them today and see what happens as a result of that ministry. As we usually think of Jonah as the ministry to the Ninevites, but he also as a ministry to these pagan mariners as well, which is kind of interesting to think about. We often skip that piece. Then the next part we read was chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 10, and we recognize that this taught us about Jonah's prayer for salvation and how he prayed to God, and we're going to look at that passage, and we're going to learn more about prayer as well, the types of prayer, the types of prayer that Jonah is using, the types of the pagan crew is using, and so forth. Then we went on, and the next section was chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and we titled that one that we have a God of second chances, because he does give Jonah a second chance and gives him another set of orders. And, uh, and we'll look at that as well. The next section, verses 4 through 10, showed that Jonah's ministry to Nineveh was effective. And we'll see the effect on what happened. Not only did the people of Nineveh repent, but God relented of the punishment he was going to serve them for a period of time. And then we read the fourth chapter, and the first part, verses 1 through 4, is Jonah's angry prayer. And we're going to look at anger and what Jonah does and how Jonah reacts to that. And then the last section, chapter 4, verses 5 through 10, uh, we, looked at God's, we will look at God's compassion and mercy and what those are and how God has actually brought Jonah from where he was to God's view of compassion, or he leaves him with God's view of compassion and mercy. Uh, we also, last week, considered as food for thought the many things the Scripture tells us that God prepared in his interaction with Jonah. He prepared a great wind on the waters of deceit. He prepared a tempest or a water spout within the sea. He then prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. He prepared a gourd 
to give Jonah some shade and comfort from the sun. And then he prepared a worm to attack that gourd and wither it and take that away. Then he prepared a vehement east wind to blow on Jonah and to wilt him. And then he had prepared the people of Nineveh. I talked briefly about the famine they were going through and the earthquake they had experienced and the total eclipse they had experienced. And then we recognize the entire book is all along the preparation of Jonah to do God's work and to move him from a man of arrogance and pride to a man of compassion and mercy. So that's what we looked at last week. And we recognize that the book of Jonah at the end of chapter 4, verse 11, doesn't end. It stops. And it stops because the story of Jonah and the story of God preparing one for his work continues on in us. And we are the final chapter of Jonah. And we'll look at that when we get to that as well. So that kind of catches us up to what we did last week. We covered a lot of territory to introduce the book. Does anyone have any questions about what we did last week as we prepare for our detailed analysis of chapter one? Any questions or comments? Yeah, John, I, I, I look at this and you say this is well, preparing us, and I think that's true. But I think this whole issue with Jonah is an issue against the nation of Israel. Because he wanted the nation of Israel to witness to the Gentiles. I mean, that's from the very beginning. And they didn't do it. They set themselves arrogance and pride and above the Gentile dogs. And I think this is a message to the nation of Israel at that time, not only a message to us in the future. That's just my view. Well, you know, and part of that view, I think, also is we're looking at some some racism here, too. We're looking at a group of people that don't necessarily want the Gentiles to be saved. Right. Just like Jonah really doesn't want the Ninevites to be delivered either. They want to keep that blessing and that gift of God to themselves. And that's not how God's gift is administered. He administers himself to everyone who will accept his son. And he cleanses everyone who will accept Jesus by taking their sins and nailing them to the cross. And God, Jehovah's message is not only for the Jews, but for all the nations. And I think not only is this talking, as you've said correctly, Dave, to the, to the Jewish nation, it's also talking about some, uh, some unwillingness to share that with others. And we're learning from Jonah that this message is an evangelistic message to share with all nations. So well said. Thank you for that, bringing that out. Anyone else with other comments? Yes. Go ahead, Ryan. I have a couple reasons why Jonah fled, read from some commentaries. One was um, he loved Israel, and he knew that when he preached to Nineveh, they would repent and it would look bad on Israel because they had been preached to many times and did not repent. Okay. Number okay. one. Um, and I went blank on number two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to continue then while you're having your blank moment. And when he comes <laughs> back, let me know and I'll allow you back in. We have those all the time. That's okay. All right. Anyone else? Yes, Rock John. On. Ed Collins? Uh, John, uh, could you explain what you mean by pride? Where do I say pride? Is it on what we're looking Number at Number seven, arrogance and pride. He's preparing Jonah himself to, be, to move from arrogance and pride okay. to compassion and mercy. Oftentimes when we do something, we like to keep it to ourselves. And pride motivates us sometimes to keep the best things for ourselves. And I think that's where Jonah was, where Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to share in the mercy of God. He wanted to keep that to the Jewish people. And I think that was pride motivating him to do that. Thank you. Okay. All right, Ryan, go ahead with number two. Second one was they considered that he was one of the prophets earlier that preached to Israel to repent, and they did for a, a short time. And so what he said would happen didn't happen. And 
some who do, do not understand repentance thought he was a false prophet. And he was afraid that the same thing would happen with Nineveh. He was going to prophesy their destruction and then the repentance would cause God to turn from that judgment as repentance does for God. And again, he would be considered a false prophet and mocked. Okay. All right. Good. Anyone else? Yeah, hey, John. John. Go ahead, Barry. I'm sorry. Hey, who wrote Jonah? It's written in third person. Right. And we don't have an answer to that. Some people still say it was written by Jonah. Uh, some that it was written by a scribe. We, I don't know that we have an answer who wrote Jonah. That was my conclusion as well. Yeah, some of the early, uh, early transcripts of when they were putting the Bible together didn't even include the story of Jonah because they couldn't identify exactly who the author was. So that is a, a, a debate that people who want to uh, uh, cross every T and dot every I want to know exactly who wrote everything. I don't think we know exactly who wrote Jonah. All right, anyone else? Herb, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if I may. Um, first of all, I think uh, God wrote Jonah, and uh, I don't think that's a debate. Uh, secondly, but my point was, is not Jonah the first foreign uh, prophet or prophet to a foreign nation in the book? Is this not brand new to Israel? Based upon what we've studied so far, he's the first one sent to a foreign nation. Now, Obadiah writes about Edom, but he does, he's not sent there. But, right. but uh, Jonah is sent to a foreign nation. First prophet I know of. Okay. All the rest of the prophets speak to Israel, Judah, uh, and the entire kingdom. Right. So this may be part of, you know, it, 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 it may be some confusion in his heart, too, because he's saying, wait, 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 we don't do this. We don't do this. If they're going to hell, let them go to hell. That's, I think, an attitude. So, okay, yeah, there's that pride coming in again. Yeah. Daniel spoke yeah. to Babylon. Daniel spoke as well before this, right? Well, no, he interpreted dreams, didn't he? Did he Did he speak to uh, Well, Daniel was also a seer, so yes. He, he did more than interpret dreams. Jesus called yeah. him a prophet. Yeah. So, yeah. He's a, he's a prophet, there's no doubt. But, you know... I, your, I your, guess, point, your, yeah, point I is, your point is well made, that yeah, Jonah is. does take it outside of the Jewish circle and, and go to uh, one of the adjoining nations. That's a good point. All right, good. Jonah had right. a choice. Daniel didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, so let's go on now. And last week, we started to look at the first chapter, and we looked at the first five verses. And I have put up here what we created by taking in blue the King James and adding in Hebrew words. So if you weren't here last week and you want to fill in the blanks, most of them are here. I reworded it a little differently as I added in some of these words. But uh, let me go ahead and read through verses 1 through 5 uh, in this, what I call, amplified version. And then we'll move on with the new material for today. Jonah 1, verse 1. Now the word and command of the Lord came unto Jonah during the reign of King Jeroboam II, about 785 BCE, the son of Amittai, the faithful, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out and call out against it, for their wickedness and malignancy has come up before me in front of my face. But Jonah rose up to flee, to run away unto Tarshish of Spain from the presence and face of the Lord, and went down, descending in elevation to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence and face of the Lord. But the Lord sent out and hurled like a spear a great wind, a breath or spirit into and upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest or water spout in the sea. 
so that the ship was like to be broken into pieces and shattered. Then the mariners, the sailors, were afraid and trembling in fear and anguish, and they cried, Every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares of silver and gold that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides to the lowest part of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep in a dead sleep. So that's that initial passage that we looked at, and we added in the Hebrew for understanding last week. And we read that God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And this was where the Assyrian army, the bad boys, were housed and trained there. And he was to go to that citadel and preach against them for their wickedness and tell them that they would soon be destroyed. Instead of obeying God, Jonah is defiant and he runs in the opposite direction. Now, some people would think that Jonah's running because he's afraid of the militia that is stationed in Assyria, these bloodthirsty individuals there, and he's going to tell them they're going to be destroyed, and that maybe he's afraid that they would take his life. But that isn't it at all. Jonah pays for this expensive trip, and he runs away from God, and he's doing it, we'll learn, because he doesn't want God's mercy to forgive them. So Tarshish was as far away as he could get from where he was told to go. So we closed our study last Friday by reading that God sent a tempest to confront the ship and Jonah. But Jonah is fast asleep below deck. Today, we pick up our study in verse 6. Are there any questions on the first five verses before we move on to verse 6? Verse 6, so the shipmaster came to him and said to him, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. So again, let's look at some of these words here. What is a shipmaster, the individual who comes to Jonah? Who is that? Captain? That's what most commentaries say. There is some debate about that. Who else could it be? He's a rope handler. (laughs) A rope handler? All right, anyone else? Yeah. When you look at some early transcripts, it says that he's the master of the purse. So he's the one who collects the fare. He's the conductor, like of the train, who goes around to stamp your ticket and make sure you've paid your fare. So that's who also this shipmaster, and usually that individual is the captain, okay? So he comes around to Jonah, who is the paid guest, okay, and took a lot of money to get on that treasure ship. So Jonah's very well-to-do. Shipmaster knows it. So he's coming in person to Jonah to talk to him to see if Jonah maybe can influence his God to save them. So the shipmaster is the captain or the one holding the purse. Now he calls him, O sleeper. Now a sleeper, he's in a heavy, deep sleep, deaf to sound, and he's probably snoring. And he's making his own noise so he doesn't hear the noise of the tempest outside. And the shipmaster comes to Jonah and says, call upon thy God, okay, Elohim, Their gods, with the little g, is just L-E-L, because the shipmaster wants Jonah to see if he can, since the pagan gods haven't responded and they haven't saved them, the shipmaster thinks, well, maybe this rich man's god will do better than the poor man's god. So, Jonah, we want you to go to your god, and maybe he will shine on us and think upon us and cast his light on us so that we don't die and be destroyed. So when we put the Hebrew together here, we see that the the one holding the purse, collecting the fares, the captain, comes to Jonah and says, come out of your deep sleep, O rich man, and call upon Elohim your God, 
and he may shine on us and save us so we're not destroyed. So that's the message here of verse 6. So this man who comes to Jonah is the treasurer or the captain, and he's coming to the paying customer, the rich man, and asking him to call upon his God, okay? And the, the captain doesn't appear to know that Jonah is a prophet or a preacher. He doesn't, all he knows is that he's well of well means. All right, any questions on verse 6? All right, 7 through 8. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come, and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. They said, then unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is your occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? So they come to Jonah to find out something about him and see if he can help them figure out what they haven't done right to appease the gods so they have a safe journey. So they are going to do that by casting lots. Now, casting lots is a method they would use to find liars, to find the truth. And they would use it kind of like drawing straws, and whoever got the short straw, he's the one. Okay? Or they would roll die. There were various ways of casting lots. Okay? And they did this because they wanted to acknowledge or recognize or unveil who's hiding the truth here. Okay, they want to out the person who is bringing this calamity upon them. So they go to Jonah and they want to know this adversity they're facing, this evil, is it coming from Jonah? So they want to know about him. What's, what's your occupation, man? Okay, what is your work, your position, your trade? What do you do? And, and where do you come from? What land do you come from? What country? And, and what people do you belong to? What tribe? So they want to get a little uh, knowledge about who is this guy that has the lots have indicated is the one who has caused this trouble for us. So who comes to Jonah next? Who are these people? Sailors. Sailors, all right. Anything else? The word here used is mariner, and that is a master sailor. It's not just a conscript that they've captured on the beach and put into the ship. These are guys who are experienced. They know what they're doing. They're a top crew because they're on a treasure ship. And the word for wares, we see that, that the wares this ship is hauling is the payments for others. The gold and silver, and that's what they start to throw over, we find out a little later. Okay? So this crew, this pagan crew, who have other gods, other elves that they worship, they come to him after casting lots. And the lot falls to Jonah. So they interview him to try to find out what he has done to bring this tempest upon them. Verses 9 through 12. And he, Jonah, said to them, the pagan crew, I am an Hebrew. Now he got a bunch of questions. And the first question he answers that he chooses is he's a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew, dirtballs, pride, okay? I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then the men, exceedingly afraid, and said to him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. 
Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know, I know that it's for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Okay? So here's Jonah confessing to them he knows why they're facing death because of him. And he's fleeing the face and presence of the Lord. So when he calls himself a Hebrew, what he's saying is it literally means from the Jordan, from the area of the Jordan River. Okay, that's where the Hebrews originated, and that's what that expression means. Now, he's saying here that he fears the Lord. Now, this word for fear is different than the word for fear in verse 5. In verse 5, they were trembling in their shoes. They were afraid. Here, fear means reverence and awe. So Jonah's saying something a little differently here that we use the same word for, right? And he's saying he has a reverence for, a, a respect for the God of heaven. And heaven here is the highest heaven. The throne of heaven is who this God of the Hebrews, Jehovah, is. And he made, he created the sea that we're in and the dry land. He's the creator God, the top God, the one at the top of the pack. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and this is the trembling in fear, okay? And they want to know, why have you done this? Because he fled or withdrew from the presence of the Lord, all right? And he had revealed it to them. He had already declared it to them that he was fleeing the Lord. Then they said, all right, what should we do? That the sea can be calm or quiet down and not be a danger to us. What do we need to do? For the sea wrought. Right, what, was, what does the word wrought mean? Angry. Angry? All right. Anyone else? It actually means angry, but anger that's growing. When we say something is wrought, it's getting bigger. So it's increasing. So the fury of the tempest, the fury of the storm of the gale is increasing this whole time they're having this nice little waterside chat with Jonah, the Hebrew, who worships the God of all creation and has ticked him off because he's fled from his presence. These sailors are really afraid here. And this is a tempestuous or an enraged sea that they find themselves in. And they say, what are we supposed to do? And he says, now this is what he says. You have to murder me. What? That's what it says. You have to take me up and throw me into the storm. And for all practical purposes, they're realizing, well, we're going to throw this man to his death if we throw him overboard. Now, you'll notice Jonah here, he knows he's the cause, doesn't he? He knows he's at fault and that he's the one who's causing their peril. Does he volunteer to save them by jumping in? No, not Jonah. Not old, proud, arrogant Jonah. If you want to be safe, you have to kill a man. You have to commit murder and kill me. That's what he's telling them. This is Jonah, okay? The proud, arrogant Jonah. You have to take me up. You have to lift me up. You have to hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. I know it's for my account 
that this great whirlwind is upon you. So you want to solve it? Kill me. That's what Jonah is saying. This proud, arrogant Hebrew. Now, I've given you a little different perspective of the man Jonah. Any thoughts or comments? Um, this good morning, brethren. I, I have a, a maybe a comment or a question altogether. Go ahead. It's interesting that the Lord is manifesting disproval through a tempest. I mean, how does that translate to our lives? Um, what is God actually trying to do with the tempest? Is he, is he trying to, well, he's preparing an event for Jonah. Um, but basically my question is, how does that translate? What exactly is God doing with this storm? Which obviously it was because of, of, of Jonah's uh, disobedience, because once he was thrown into the, into the ocean, uh, it was calm. It went calm. But how does that translate into our life? What exactly is God doing? What does this tempest mean? Thank you. Let me ask you a question while, while, I, while I have you. I'm going to give you two words. Disobedience and defiance. Is one worse than the other? I'd say no. No? Does anybody else... I was raised to believe that defiance is worse than disobedience. Well, after thinking about it just a second more, yeah. yes, definitely defiance is more disrespectful than, than disobedience, yes. Okay, this is what Jonah is doing here. When, when we look at the words that describe what Jonah is doing in respect to God, he's not only disobeying him, he's defying him. Okay. So Jonah is committing an act of defiance against God here, which is, in, in my view, when, when I disobeyed my father, it was one level of bad. When I defied him, it was a whole nother level of bad. That's how I was raised with, with those words. All right. Herb, you have a comment. Go ahead, sir. A couple now. Uh, defiance requires chastisement. You know, disobedience might require some persuasion, maybe if the father is kind and gentle, uh, but defiance requires chastisement. Okay. So, but what I was going to say is my, uh, my devotion this morning was on aliyah, which is the Hebrew word to go up. And the Jews are constantly called to go up to the temple. The temple is on a high mount, so they are always called to go up. Where did in this reading of Jonah, where did Jonah go? First, he went down to Joppa. Then he went down in the hull of the ship. He wasn't going up at all. He was in defiance of God's whole attitude of a Jew, supposed to be going up, up to the temple. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, it. Jonah's at the bottom and digging deeper. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah. Good, good point. Uh, I like <clears throat> that. Very good point. Collins, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, let John go. Uh, Ryan, go ahead first. Okay. So I have a different take. Humble Jonah, like Moses, when God was going to destroy his people, he says, no, remove me from the book of life. David, after the census, I believe, when God was going to take out a bunch of Israelites, so said, no, take me and my father's house. And Jonah, when he realized God's purpose for having Nineveh repent when Israel didn't was take me out, not hurt the Israelites. Okay. Well, these aren't Israelites. These are pagan sailors, but... Yeah. No, no. I'm talking about he knew God would use the repentance of Nineveh to oh, shame okay. Israel because they didn't repent and, and hurt them. Okay. All right. John. Go ahead, Annette. Yeah, I just want to go back to, to Jonah here. Um, I find it interesting that he has come to almost a calm resolution that, okay, the only way to do this, I'm not going to just let us all go down. So I'm going to head and offer myself calmly. It makes me wonder if he felt like 
God would save him because he had been given a task and that he hoped for a second chance or that he believed that God would have forgiven him. So, okay, his death is fine. I just find it interesting that just as Christ willingly gave himself um, to save all of us, Jonah is willingly come to the conclusion that he needs to willingly give up himself for the safety of the, those on the boat. I, I just like the, I mean, I just am kind of, my eyes were just open to kind of the the correlation mm-hmm. similarities. I'm, I'm a little less uh, generous to Jonah because I think Jonah is a bit of a cad. And I think Jonah is a bit of a, at this point in his life, at that point, he's he, he's an arrogant Hebrew and he thinks he's better than everybody else. And he doesn't have to obey God. He can do what he wants. He can take his riches and his money and his purse and take a treasure ship and go to Spain instead of doing the work God is. I, I, I think Jonah is not a good practitioner of his faith at this point in his life. That's going to change. That's what this book is all about. And I want you to be able to see the man Jonah now and who he is and what he is and what he becomes as the experience is ended. That's why I want to make sure you see the contrast. I just think that that he cared about the people on the boat. But otherwise, he would have just let them all go down together. It's, it's just well, If he really cared about the people on the boat, I think he'd have done a nice uh, uh, dive off the boat. Swan dive. Yeah. yeah, and would not have brought on them the guilt of throwing a man and committing murder. Okay. That's yeah. the different Got perspective it. I bring to you. Yeah, an interesting note here, because we brought up this tempestuous wind. Mm-hmm. It's funny that he prepared this wind here for a purpose of, it appears, chastisement. All right? He prepares that same wind in the book of Acts for Paul to actually direct them into another direction. So it wasn't chastisement, even though it was the same type of win. So I find it interesting that you said he prepared this particularly for a cause, and he uses the same thing to direct us somewhere else. So what my point is, is not always when we see weather or we see events or their chastisement, sometimes it's a changing us into a different direction or moving us into a different direction. Anyway, for what it's worth. Have any of you ever had the uh, privilege of seeing a water spout in the water? Yeah. Yeah. And when the water spout moves by, usually you watch the water spout. Have you ever looked at the water left behind by the water spout? It's white. Do you know why it's white? It's aerated. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about what I'm saying now. What is God going to use that tempest for when he takes Jonah into the sea? Jonah, a man who needs to breathe air. Think about it. It's interesting, Mm -hmm. isn't it? It's Mm -hmm. interesting. A straw in the liquid, a tunnel in the air. Interesting. There's something for you to think about. All right, let's go on. So Jonah describes himself as a Hebrew from the Jordan that he reveres the creator God, but he's disobeying him. Yeah, I revere him, but I'm still going to defy him at the same time. And he's trying to run away from him. Now, you notice Jonah tells the truth. He doesn't lie. But he requires direct questions to get answers from him. That's arrogance also. He's not willing the answers. He's not giving them up freely. They have to go through an interview with him. The ship is sinking, it's being shaken, the tempest is upon them, and Jonah's going through an interview. And it's just interesting. The crew are terrified, and they ask Jonah, what should they do? And Jonah tells them, if you want to calm the storm, you have to throw me into the sea. I'm not going to jump in. You have to take the action and throw me into the sea. So that's where we are now. Someone had a comment? Yeah, I was just simply going to say, uh, how does Jonah describe himself? And I think you said it correctly, but I just wrote simply, he described himself as the problem and the solution. All right, well, that's, <laughs> that's an arrogance. interesting way to look at it. Yep. That's, that's arrogance. Okay, yep. So another idea on the running away. 
Jonah knew very well you can't run and hide from God, but it's the prophecy. At the beginning, God told him to cry out against Nineveh, but there were no specifics. So he ran away because prophecy is usually only given in the land of Israel. So he's running to not get the rest of the prophecy message running to the sea. You know, it's interesting, Ryan. God never tells Jonah to prophesy to the Ninevites. No. He never tells them that. He tells them to preach to them. Look at the word. It's the word for preach. It's not the word for prophesy. So that's really interesting. So I agree with your point. The prophesy, the prophecies come to Israel, but to the Gentiles, he is sent as a preacher to preach to them about their malignant ways. That's an interesting distinction. He's not really being a prophet to them. He's being a preacher to them. It's interesting. It is. All right. Sure. Lord Father, thank you for the honor and the opportunity to go through your word this morning. Uh, I echo what Barry said. Uh, I just, uh, I thank all the people that are here that are diligent, that carve out time to make word, make time for the word of God each and every day of the week. Uh, this is a special day each day that we go through training and teaching and gaining in our knowledge, gaining in our uh, relationship and our fellowship with our Lord. The more we know him, the closer we get to him, the more we have fellowship with him and more committed we are our lives to them. Lord, I just thank you for John's diligence, and I just thank you for all that you have blessed us with this day. Look over everyone to have a great week coming up, and I pray all these things in the name of your precious Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.